Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'd like to start and welcome. Thank you all for braving the snow and the freezing weather to come to the Crash Impact Lecture. Crash Impact Lectures are a series we hold each year, if we can, which are uh, designed to link together our intellectual activity with social activity and social process. Over the last couple of years, we've been focusing in particular on race and gender. And uh, anyone who's been in Cambridge for a while will know why that seems like quite a good topic for us to do. Oh. And it's an extraordinarily big pleasure for me tonight to be able to introduce Sarah Ahmed from a uh, non-institutional context, um, who is one of the feminist writers, I think, who's influencing the current debate more than anybody else. Her work on diversity, her work on race, her work on gender, her work on inclusivity has been absolutely instrumental in the way I certainly think about these things, and I think pretty well everyone who thinks about them thinks about them. So it's, uh, I hope you will join me in welcoming Sarah to give the Crash Impact Lecture for this time. Thank you, and it is a great achievement to all of you for, to be here. I hope you get home safely. I'm already worrying about people's exit routes. But thank you, Simon, and I, I'm a, a pleasure to be part of Crash and the Impact series. So I'm going to be talking tonight about uses of use, diversity, utility, and the university. On February the 9th, 1825, the Scottish poet Thomas Campbell published a letter in the Times addressed to Sir Henry Brougham, a Liberal member of the House of Commons. This letter was followed up by another piece published in the April edition of the Monthly Review. Both pieces of writing call for the formation of a new English university to be based in London, which was to offer a secular alternative to Oxford and Cambridge. That university, originally called University of London, now called University College London, was founded a year after publication of Campbell's letter, almost to the day, on February 11th, 1826. Campbell's letters could be considered the first attempt to give a written expression to the utilitarian principles upon which the modern university was to be based, though his role in establishing the new university has been largely forgotten. A painting by Henry Tonks, the four founders of UCL, does, however, place Campbell at the founding moment. The painting is described thus. Kneeling at the right is the architect William Wilkins, who presents his plans of the building to Jeremy Bentham, standing in the centre of the composition, and the poet Thomas Campbell, who first conceived of the idea of a London university. The painting places Bentham himself as the recipient of the plan. He did not, however, play any such role in the setting up of London University. He was over 80 at the time, although he's often called the spiritual father of the UCL by the UCL. And I think this description is apt, this evocation of a certain kind of paternity. We could consider, for instance, the influence of Bentham's own plan for a school that was to be for the children of the middle classes, entitled Crestomathia, a school that was to be organised under the rubric of useful knowledge. Bentham described, the classical squalor may be better qualified for decorating his speech with rhetorical flowers, but the Crestomathic scholar after a familiar and thorough acquaintance has been contracted with things, with things of all sorts, will be in a more useful and efficient way, qualified for the co general course of parliamentary business. Now, Bentham's plans for the school, rather like his plan for a prison, did not come about. But I think they did influence the shape and direction of the new university. <laughs> Indeed, Robert Young has described the University of London as the Crestomathic University. During this period of the early 19th century, many utilitarian thinkers were involved in educational projects of different kinds. Some of those involved in the setting up of London University, such as James Mill and Lord Henry Brougham, were also involved in the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge, the SDUK, which was established in the same year. Its core mission was to make knowledge more accessible, in part by producing a series of pamphlets such as the Penny Magazine, which was intended for middle class and working class readers. The materials they produced formed what they called a library of useful knowledge. We can learn from the sheer volume of what was left behind by this organisation, how useful knowledge was not simply an idea that was in circulation, 
but how it involved administering, organizing, meetings and minutes. Words and concepts do not travel on their own. They are picked up and put into papers that are passed around, creating trails for us to follow. I will not be addressing the history of the idea of useful knowledge today, though I do think it's a fascinating history and it's one from which I have learned a great deal. But I wanted to open my lecture by referring to this history as it helps us to challenge any notion that utility arrives late to the university or that utility is a foreign policy imposed upon universities from elsewhere. In fact, I think it's important to remember that the modern university was conceived as a utilitarian project. My argument will eventually lead to a discussion of utility as a policy, but I do not start there. To start there would, not, would allow us not to witness how use shapes what is already here and who is already here. So I start not with utility, but with use. Indeed, one of my projects is to put use back into utilitarianism, which tends to be understood in a rather restricted way as a branch of moral philosophy or as a mode of economic rationality. And by use, I include use as an ordinary and dynamic activity, use as how we take hold of things of all sorts, to use Bentham's own terms. So when I say I want to put use back into utilitarianism, I acknowledge that use is already there. Utility is a use word, of course, albeit one with a narrower philosophical pedigree. Use is already there in the archives. Perhaps it is there in part because of how it went missing. In a letter sent to the SDUK by William Adamson in 1830, the word use, if you can see it here, <laughs> is double underlined. And he's making a point that useful knowledge must involve use as an activity. Adamson writes, the art of reading is taught, but not its use. He argues that there is a lack of attention to use as an activity within the materials that are circulated by the Society for Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. He gave emphasis to use as an activity because he thought that use had not been emphasised enough. We can share an emphasis. I picked up that letter because of how it picked up on use. So my task in today's lecture is to think about diversity and universities by starting with use, a small word that has a lot of work to do. Rita Felsky has called use workmanlike, a small word with a big history. Use has had and does have many uses. I'll be drawing on ideas I've been developing in a new book called What's the Use? where I'm following use around the way I followed happiness in The Promise of Happiness and the will in Willful Subjects. To follow use is to connect bodies of work that are usually kept distinct, such as literatures in design, psychology and biology that make use of use to explain the acquisition of form. My arguments about diversity and use, including the use of diversity, build upon work by Chandra Tapahed, Malhanti, Gloria Vecker, Jackie Alexander and Heidi Mirza, who have offered powerful critiques of diversity in the academy as a way of building feminists of colour and black feminist counter-institutional knowledge. So this first section is called Uses of Use. So in this section, I want to offer a meditation on use as a biography, as a way of telling a story of things. Use when used as a verb can mean to employ for some purpose, to expend or consume, to treat or behave toward, to take unfair advantage of or exploit, to habituate or accustom. Use is a relation as well as an activity that often points beyond something, even when use is about something, to use something points to what something is for. Some objects are made in order to be used. We might call these simply designed objects. What they are for brings them into existence. A cup is made in order that I have something to drink from, it is shaped this way, with a hole as its heart, empty, so that it can be filled by liquid. We might summarise the implied relation as for is before. However, even if something is shaped around what it is for, that is not the end of the story. As Howard Rosati has noted in A Theory of Craft, 
Use need not correspond to intent and function. Most, if not all, objects can have or use or more accurately be made usable by being put to use. A sledgehammer can pound or it can be used as a paperweight or lever. A handsaw can cut a board and be used as a straight edge or to make music. A chair can be sat in and used to pop open a door. These uses make them useful objects, but since they are unrelated to the intended purpose and function for which these objects are made, knowing these uses doesn't reveal much about these objects. So use can correspond to intended function, but use does not necessarily correspond to intended function. This not, not necessarily, is an opening. I am not so sure if uses are quite as unrevealing about things as Rossetti implies. I am being told something about the qualities of a sledgehammer, that it can be used to be a paperweight. That a sledgehammer can be used as a paperweight tells me about the heaviness of the sledgehammer. Something cannot be used for anything. Use, then, is a restriction of possibility that is, material, that is material. Nevertheless, there is something queer about use because intentions do not exhaust possibilities. The keys that are used to unlock a door can be used as a toy, perhaps because they are shiny and silver, perhaps because they jangle. Note also the implication in this quote that use makes something usable. I think this strange temporality matters. What makes something possible can come after, and we are perhaps more used to thinking of possibility as precedence. Use can also make something used. When we think of something as being used, we might think of buying something second hand, like this book, which was a book on hands that was handy, which I bought as a used book. A used book is usually cheaper than a new book, and more signs of usage equals less value unless the user is esteemed when the value of a person can rub off on the value of a thing. Wear and tear usually means a depreciation of value. Marx, in Capital, discusses wear and tear in relation to machines. The material wear and tear of a machine is of two kinds. The one arises from use, as coins wear away by circulating, the other from non-use, as swords rust when it's left in its scabbard. Marx showed how machinery intensifies rather than saves labour. You have to get the most out of the machine before it wears out. A wearing that is passed on to workers, wearing as passing on and passing out, used as used up. So wear and tear in this economy is the loss of value determined by the extraction of value. To value use might require a change of values. To value use would not be to romanticise what is preserved as a historical record. Signs of life can be signs of exhaustion, which is to say signs of life can be signs of how a life has been extinguished. Perhaps we can think of use as a record of the fragility of a life. The marks left behind by use could be treated then not as the erosion of value, but as testimony, the scratches on a table as how a table testifies to a history. In writing about use, I've deliberately made use of used books. They are part of my archive. And with this book in my hands, I can tell that others have been here before. I think of the reader who circled the word grief. I cannot reach you, but you left a trace. Use leaves traces in places. Something might be in use or out of use. When something breaks, it might be taken out of use, rather like this cup, which has lost its handle, a rather sad parting. When we think of something in use, we might think of a sign on a door, occupied. The sign tells us the toilet is in use, it tells us we cannot use a toilet until whoever is using the toilet is finished. Use often comes with instructions that are about preserving, maintaining social and bodily boundaries. Or take this image of a post box. There is a sign that politely asks the would-be poster not to use the post box by posting a letter into the box. So in the previous image, the toilet was occupied because it was in use. In this case, the post box is out of use because it is occupied. Although, of course, from another point of view, it is in use. It has become a home for nesting birds. So intended functionality can mean who something is for, not just what something is for. And this means that something can be used 
by those for which it was not intended. That a post box can become a nest is still telling us something about the nature of the object. We learn about form when a change of function does not require a change of form. But that change does still require something, a sign, please do not use, and use is often used in signs, a sign that is in use to stop what would be usual, posting a letter through the box. The sign we assume is temporary. The post box will come back into use as a post box when it ceases to be a nest. Back into use. Use can involve comings and goings. Take the example of the well-trodden path. The path exists in part because people have used it. Use involves contact and friction. The tread of feet smoothing the surface, the path is becoming smoother, easier to follow. The more a path is used, the more a path is used. How strange that this sentence makes sense. Without use, a path can disappear, becoming overgrown, bumpy or unusable, like this path. We know it's a path because of a sign, but you can hardly see the sign for the leaves. Use can be necessary for preservation. Use it or lose it. This is not only a mantra in personal training, which apparently it is. It can also become a philosophy of life, not using, not being. A path can appear like a line on a landscape, but a path can also be a route through life. Collectivity can be acquired as direction. The more a path is travelled upon, the clearer it becomes. And a path can be kept clear or maintained. You can be supported by how a route is cleared. Heterosexuality, for instance, can become a path, a route through life, a path that is kept clear or maintained, not only by the frequency of use, and a frequency can be an invitation, but by an elaborate support system. When it is harder to proceed, when a path is harder to follow, you might be discouraged. You might try and find another route. A consciousness of the need to make more of an effort can be a disincentive. <coughs> just think of how we can be dissuaded by perpetual reminders of just how hard something would be. Deviation is hard. Deviation is made hard. Thoughts and feelings, they too have paths. Within empirical psychology, the path is in use as a way of thinking about thought. John Locke, for example, once suggested that thoughts once that are going, continue in the same shape they are used to, which by often tread and are worn into a smooth path, and the motion in it becomes easy and, as it were, natural. Used to that which is wearing and worn, a history of youth as a history of becoming natural. William James, in his psychology, cites the work of Dumont on habit. Everyone knows how a garment, having been worn a certain time, clings better to the shape of the body than when it was new. A lot works better after being used some time at the outset. A certain force was required to overcome certain roughness in the mechanism. A garment becomes more attuned to the body the more the garment is worn. I'll return to the well-used garment in due course. The example of the lock and the key suggested it's through use that things become easier to use. And this is how acts of use can be the building block of habit. If we took habit as the unit, we might miss these smaller steps which accumulate to take us somewhere. If use takes time, use saves time. Less effort is required to complete an action. The idea that use keeps something alive or that using something makes something easier to use is supplemented by another idea central to the emergence of modern biology, that use in making something stronger and disuse in making something weaker shapes the very form of organic life. For example, Lamarck, the French naturalist who first used the word biology in its modern sense offered as his primary law the law of use and disuse. A more frequent and continued use of any organ gradually strengthens, develops and enlarges that organ and gives it a power proportional to the length of time it has been so used or the permanent disuse of any organ imperceptibly weakens and deteriorates it and progressively diminishes its functional capacity until it finally disappears. These acquired modifications for Lamarck can be inherited, what is called simply use inheritance. Now what is used and disused for Lamarck is dependent on the environment. Use is, in other words, a kind of passivity. It's how an organism receives a message from the environment about what it needs. 
Lamarck's famous example is the giraffe's long neck, although he only uses that example once, a fact that irritates greatly Stephen Gould, who complains about how the, the giraffe, as an example, has taken the place of the general law that Lamarck is trying to illustrate. His other uh, well-known example is the blacksmith's strong arm, which he doesn't use at all. So I'm very interested in examples as having their own biographies of use. For Lamarck, the giraffe's neck grows longer, not through conscious volition, but as an effect of repeated efforts that have become directional in time. He was a theorist of time, I think. He describes efforts in a particular direction when they are sustained or habitually made by certain parts of a living body for the satisfaction of needs established by nature or environment cause an enlargement of the parts and the acquisition of a size and shape they would not have obtained if these efforts had not become the normal activities of the animal exerting them. I mean, we could spend a long time with that quote. It's, it's got a lot of um, promise for queer theory, I think, because it implies that norms become forms in time. So when an effort becomes normal, a form is acquired. And when such form is acquired, less effort is needed. The giraffe does not have to reach so high to reach the foliage. So in other words, in my terms, use inheritance translates as the lessening of the effort required to survive within an environment. So at certain points, the mark does seem to imply that a use for something would bring it into existence. And this is one of the reasons I think that Darwin was rather disparaging about Lamarck's work because of the implication he heard, rightly or wrongly, that nature has a design. We can find evidence of this disparagement in another used book, Darwin's personal copy of Lamarck's History Naturale. You can't see Darwin's own marks, but they are typed for us in digital reproduction over on this side. Darwin wrote on the margins, because use improves an organ, wishing for it or its use produces it exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And I'm actually writing about exclamation marks as an interesting example of overuse because there's a lot of very precise instructions about how you should use exclamation marks which really involve using them sparingly. So the restriction of use is part of how they function. Oh. <laughs> Despite how Lamarck and Darwin appear to deviate, from Darwin's point of view at least, on this question of use, Darwin himself often represents natural selection and the law of use and use, disuse as working together. And it's interesting to note that Darwin offers a reuse of the architect metaphor in describing the mechanism of natural selection, despite how that metaphor is understood to risk the implication of design. And I'm going to give you this quote because, again, it's incredibly interesting and I'll be drawing upon it when I talk about institutions. Let an architect be compelled to build an edifice with uncut stones fallen from a precipice. The shape of each fragment may be called accidental, yet the shape of each has been determined by the force of gravity, the nature of the rock and the slope of the precipice, events and circumstances, all of which depend on natural laws. But there is no relation between these laws and the purpose for which each fragment is used by the builder. The shape of the fragments of stone at the base of our precipice may be called accidental, but that is not strictly correct, for the shape of each depends on a long sequence of events, all obeying natural laws, on the nature of the rock, on the lines of disposition or cleavage, on the form of the mountain which depends on its upheaval and subsequent denudation, and finally on the storm or earthquake which threw down the fragments. But in regard to the use to which the fragments may be put, their shape may be strictly said to be accidental. So you can make use of stones without cutting them in order to fit a design. These stones are thrown up or available according to natural law. But the stones were not made in order to be used, like that cup which is shaped so that it can be filled by liquid. If the shape of a stone is determined by a long sequence of events, it is then still an accident that the shape of this stone fits the shape of that hole in the building of this wall. So you are more likely to use a stone that happens to fit that space. So use here is accident, but also use as happenstance, use as full of hap, use as happy. So I will return to Darwin's use of the architect met metaphor in due course. So this next section is called <coughs> the institutional as usual. If we're following use, we can follow use right back into the university. Use allows us to show how universities are assembled, as it were, brick by brick. When I visited the archives of the UCL, I was able to witness the history of decisions about how the university was to be built. On May the 6th, 1827, stones were brought to the building committee, 
Portland stones and Edinburgh stones in order to help the committee decide which stones to use. I think of the stones there on the table. They were part of the proceedings. These are different kinds of stones than the stones that Darwin is alluding to. They have been cut. They have been made to fit. But the stones, however fitting, still have a story to tell. If bricks become walls, stones become steps. J. Dormage, in his work on academic ableism, describes how steep steps are material, but also create an idea of the university. The access to the university is a movement upwards, only the truly fit survive the climb. So I want to draw in a section on my research into diversity work that I first presented in my book on being included, and which I return to in the middle section of Living a Feminist Life. When I returned to this research while writing about youth, I realised how much diversity practitioners, in reflecting on their work, also reflected on youth, and in particular, on institutional youth. And this is not surprising. Diversity workers are trying to transform institutional habits. They are thus trying to intervene in how things usually happen, to stop the flow of things, to deviate from the well-trodden paths. Diversity work often then becomes, requires becoming conscious of youth, confronting or bringing to the front what is often reproduced by receding into the background. And yet, at another level, diversity seems to be the way things are going. Diversity as a word seems to offer a rather well-travelled path, becoming an arrow even, which can be an instruction and thus a direction, go that way. Indeed, practitioners often use the word diversity because that is the word that is being used. I would say, this is one practitioner, I would say that the, word, the term diversity is just used now because it's more popular. You know, it's in the press, so why would we have equal opportunities when we can just say it's diversity? We can just say it's diversity if diversity is just used now. So here, use becomes a reason for use, the circularity of a logic transformed into a tool. Many practitioners suggest that diversity is just used now because of its effective qualities as a lighter, happier, more positive term. Another practitioner describes, diversity obscures the issues. Diversity is like a big shiny red apple, right? It all looks wonderful, but the inequalities aren't being addressed. Diversity might be used because of what it allows organisations not to address. Diversity as a smile. Sometimes you have to use words more because of what is not being done. Another practitioner notes, I think it, equity, became a tired term because it was thrown around a lot. And I think, well, I don't know because our title is Equity and Social Justice. Somebody the other day was saying to me, oh, there's equity fatigue. People are sick of the word equity. Oh, well, OK. We've gone through equal opportunity, affirmative action. They're sick of equity. Now what do we call ourselves? They're sick of it because we have to keep saying it because they are not doing it. Such institutional wisdom. <laughs> we use a word more because we are not getting through. We keep saying what it is that they do not do. Words here seem almost the opposite of muscles. The more you use the words, the floppier they become, looser, less tight, less precise, less sharp. This argument contradicts what has been called the law of exercise, which was Lamarck's first law, where to use is to strengthen. This contradiction needs to matter to a theory of use that is robust enough to explain different uses of use. So, Diversity does less because it's used more, or diversity is used more because it does less. I think this or is probably an and. So the overuse, we might say, of diversity, how it is used more, can be a sign of the difficulty of getting through. Another practitioner describes, it's a banging your head against a brick wall job. So here, a job description becomes a wall description. If you keep banging your head against a brick wall, but the wall keeps its place, it is you that gets sore. And what happens to the wall? All you seem to have done is scratched the surface. And this is what diversity work often feels like. 
scratching the surface, scratching at the surface. And even if you've only scratched the surface, you can still be liable for damages. So let me share with you an example of an encounter with an institutional wall. This example is from a practitioner who developed a new policy on academic appointments. And this is her story. It is a wall story, and like all wall stories, it's long. <laughs> when I was first here, there was a policy that you had to have three people on every panel who had been diversity trained. But then there was a decision early on when I was here that it should be everybody, all panel members, at least internal people. They took that decision at the Equality and Diversity Committee, which several members of SMT were present at. But then the Director of Human Resources found out about it and decided we didn't have the resources to support it, and it went to Council with that taken out. And Council were told that they were happy to have just three members. Only a person on Council was an external member of the Diversity Committee went ballistic, and I'm not kidding, went ballistic, and said the minutes didn't reflect what had happened in the meeting because the minutes said the decision was different to what actually happened, and I didn't take the minutes, by the way. And so they had to take it through and reverse it. And the council decision was that all people should be trained. And despite that, I have then sat in meetings where they've just continued saying that it has to be just three people on the panel. And I said, but no, council changed their view and I can give you the minutes. And they just look at me as if I'm saying something really stupid. This went on for ages, even though the council minutes definitely said all panel members should be trained. And to be honest, sometimes you just give up. So it seems as if there has been an institutional decision. But individuals within the institution must act as if the decision has been made for it to have been made. If they do not, it has not. A decision made in the present about the future is overridden by the momentum of the past. The past becomes that well-worn path. What usually happens still happens. So in this case, the head of personnel did not need to take the decision out of the minutes for the decision not to bring something into effect. I've called this dynamic non-performativity. When naming something does not bring something into effect, or where something is named in order not to bring something into effect. The wall is that which keeps standing. I think of the wall as a finding. Let me summarise that finding. What stops movement moves. In other words, the mechanisms of stopping something are mobile, which means when we witness the movement, we can miss the mechanism. And I think this is very important, as organisations are good at moving things. But creating evidence of doing something is not the same thing as doing something. This is why I've called diversity workers institutional plumbers. They have to work out not only where something is blocked, but how it is blocked. So in our example, what stopped something from happening could have been the removal of the policy from the minutes. And if that had worked, the Director of Human Resources would have had a hand in what did not happen. But that wasn't what happened because it was noticed. So what stopped something could have been not noticing that the decision had been taken out of the minutes or it could have been the failure to put the decision back into the minutes but it was none of those things. It was the way in which those within the institution acted after the policy had been agreed. We thus learn agreeing to something can be another way of stopping something from happening. And so a diversity policy can come into existence without coming into use. So I noted earlier how a sign is often used to make a transition from something being in and out of use, such as in this case of the post box that has become a nest. Institutions are also postal systems. So maybe the diversity worker deposits the policy in the post box because she assumes the post box is in use. She's right to make that assumption because she's following a procedure. The post box that is not in use without any sign declaring it to be not in use might have another function to stop the policy from going through the whole system. The policy becomes dusty, rather like Marx's rusty sword. From rusty to dusty, a policy can become unusable by not being used. Consider also the energy this practitioner expended on developing that policy that did not do anything. 
The story of how a wall keeps standing is the same story as the story of how a diversity worker becomes shattered. As she says, sometimes you just give up. Maybe you end up feeling used up, limp, spent, rather like this tube of toothpaste, as if you've got nothing left to give. Or maybe you fly off the handle to recall that broken cup, an expression that can mean to snap or to lose your temper. To lose a handle on things can mean to lose yourself. You become the one who can't handle it. You don't have to say anything to be heard as breaking something. Another practitioner describes, you know, you go through that in these sort of jobs where you've got to say something. You can just see people going, oh, here she goes. We both laugh recognising that each other recognised that scene. The feminist killjoy, that leaky container, she comes up here. She comes up in what we can hear. We hear each other in the wear and the tear of the words we share. We hear what it's like to come up against the same thing over and over again. We imagine the eyes rolling as if to say, well, she would say that. It was from experiences like this that I developed my equation, rolling eyes equals feminist pedagogy. I think it's important to note that the policy that was stopped by not being used was a policy about how academic appointments are made. A university is a history of appointments. When I visited the UCL archives, I got a sense of the shape of that history. The secretary wrote letters in response to those who expressed interest in teaching at this new university. Once you had read one of these letters, it seemed like you'd read them all. They were standardised. A standard is what you create when you use the same form. So I was getting a bit tired of reading these letters. And then one letter jumped out. It was a letter sent in response to Professor Johann Frederick Meckel in 1827, a Lamarckian, who was a star professor in his time. And what was striking about this letter sent to Meckel was how all of the standards were suspended. The letter is long and personal and gushing, detailed. It can become a standard to suspend a standard. I know of many more recent cases where the usual procedures are bypassed to enable the recruitment of such and such star professor, even though that bypassing is a bypassing of the equal opportunities procedures that are supposed to be compulsory. We can begin to appreciate a difficulty here. Diversity workers might try to develop new procedures to stop the reproduction of the same thing, but procedures are what is suspended to enable that very reproduction. Appointment panels are thus places to go if you want to learn more about how institutions are reproduced, about how decisions are made about who is, to use a much used term in the British context, appointable. A person in a diversity training session I attended shared that people in her department had an unofficial criteria for appointability, whether someone was, quote unquote, the kind of person you could take down to the pub. They wanted someone who can inhabit spaces with them, being with as being like, someone they can relate to, drink with. I remember one time a woman of colour was being considered for a job in my department. She worked on race and sexuality. And someone said in a meeting with concern, but we already have Sarah, as if having one of us was more than enough. There was a murmured consensus that she replicated me, even though our work was quite different. There was no concern about other such areas. Concern. No concern how things stay the same by seeing others as the same. I want to go back to my discussion of uses of use. An institution is an environment, and environments are dynamic. It is because environments change that uses change. An institution is also, however, a container technology. You can reproduce something by stabilising the requirements for what you need to survive or thrive in an environment. Once these requirements have been stabilised, they do not need to be made explicit. Use becomes instead a question of fit. Remember Darwin's use of the architect metaphor. The builder uses the stone that just happens to fit. An institution is, as we know, built. So it appears as if the moment of use is hap, that this person just happens to fit the requirements, that this stone just happens to be the same shape and the same size as the hole in the wall. But once a building has been built, more or less. Once it has taken form, more or less. Some, more than others, will fit the requirements. Indeed, then HAP can be used ideologically, as if they are here just because they happen to fit, rather than they fit because of how the structure was built. A structure, in other words, 
is the gradual removal of HAP from use in the determination of a requirement. In the Marx model, use became inheritance in shaping form. It lessens the effort required to do something within a given environment. When you fit, and fitting here can be formal, a question of form, you can inherit the lessening of effort. So a path, let's say in the sense of a career path, or even a life trajectory, is not simply made more usable by being used. Some have paths laid out more clearly in front of them because they already fit a requirement. In other words, it's not just the constancy of use that eases a passage. Use is ease for those who inherit the right form, whereby rightness means a degree of fit with an expectation that is often not articulated. For, as before, acquires a new resonance here. When a world is built for some, they come before others. So this first section is called Occupied. People do come to inhabit organisations that are not intended for them. You can make the cut without fitting. If you arrive into an organisation that is not built for you, you might experience that for, what it's for, as tight or as tightening. If you are the one for whom an institution is intended, for might be loose. You might experience the institution as open because it was open to you. So if use is a restriction of possibility as material, as I suggested earlier, some will encounter that restriction more than others. This is why I think of the institution as rather like an old garment. It has acquired the shape of those who tend to wear it, such that it becomes easier to wear if you have that shape. And this is also why I think of privilege as an energy-saving device. Less effort is required to pass through when a world has been assembled around you. If you arrive with dubious origins, you're not expected to be there. So in getting there, you have already disagreed with an expectation of who you are and what you can do. Then an institution can feel like the wrong shape. Annette Kuhn describes how, as a working class girl in a grammar school, she felt conspicuously out of place. She describes the sense of being out of place by giving a biography of her school uniform, a biography of use, how by the time her ill-fitting uniform came to fit, it had become shabby and scruffy. The word wear used originally derives from the Germanic word for clothing. It then acquires the secondary sense of use up or gradually damage from the effect of continued use on clothes. So it's not just that when something is used more, it fits better. If you are the wrong shape, you have to make more of an effort. Use then does not smooth a passage or enable a better fit, but leads to corrosion and damage. This difference between use that smooths and enables and use that corrodes and damages is a distributed difference. So not fitting can be about the body you have, about your own requirements. Rosemary Garland Thompson's important term, a misfit, helps us to describe these mechanisms. When you don't meet the requirements, you become a misfit. She describes being a person with a disability in an ableist institution as like being a square peg in a ground hole, in a round hole. Fitting becomes work for those who do not fit. You have to push, push, push and sometimes no amount of pushing will get you in. You can become a misfit given what has become a routine, an organisation that organises long meetings without any breaks, familiar, I'm, I'm sure, assumes a body that can be seated without breaks. If someone arrives who cannot maintain that position, they do not meet the requirements. So if you lay down during the meeting, you would throw the meeting into crisis. I think a social justice project requires throwing meetings into crisis. If a space has to be modified to enable you to participate, it is not just that it is harder for you to participate, but that your participation is deemed as being disruptive. To do the work of fitting often really means to fit in. You might have to try to fit in when or because you do not fit in. A woman of, de of colour describes this work I think for a person of colour, there's always a question of what's this woman going to turn out like. They're nervous about appointing people of colour into senior positions. Because if I went in my sari, went a prayer time off, and started rocking the boat and being a bit different and asserting my kind of culture, I'm sure they'd take it differently. So some forms of difference are heard as rocking the boat, as if you're only different because you're insistent on being different. 
I've called this labour of trying to minimise the signs of difference institutional passing. Trying not to cause a disruption might be about what you have to discard. Garments, a sari say, it might be what you do not do, it might be words you do not say, words you do not say. I suggested earlier that the word diversity might be used more because it does less as well as do less because it is used more. One woman of colour academic I spoke to for my project on complaint described to me, I was on the equality and diversity group in the university and as soon as I started mentioning things to do with race, they changed the portfolio of who could be on the committee and I was dropped. When you don't drop the words, difficult words such as race, you can be dropped. So here diversity becomes the requirement to be more attuned to the organisation. You have to do the work with a smile by not using the more negative terms. I'll return to her important testimony next week. We learn from what follows when you use the words you're not supposed to use. Words like race, words like racism, whiteness, white supremacy. Audrey Lord described so well how racism is heard as getting in the way of a smooth path of communication. Any use of the word racism is heard as an overuse of the word racism. When words evoke histories that create friction, they catch attention, they sound louder, abrasive. Words can evoke histories and bodies too. Sometimes turning up is enough to bring a history up, a history that can get in the way of an occupation of a space. A social category can be thought of as a dwelling, as that which gives residence. A professor can be a category in which we reside. Some have to insist on belonging to the categories that give residence to others. Pierre Aurelis reflects on how, as a professor of colour, he's often met with surprise. After I formally introduce myself in class, I have undergraduate students who ask me in a surprised tone of voice, are you really the professor? I sometimes overhear them asking their peers, is he really the professor? Really, really, are you sure? Being asked whether you are the professor is another way of being made into a stranger, being asked where you are from as a way of saying you are not from here. Brown, black, not from here, not from here, not here, not. You might walk into a seminar room with a white male professor. You're both professors. But you can feel the gaze land upon him, plop, plop. You don't appear as professor because you are not how a professor usually appears. And he is addressed as a professor, hello professor. And if you were to say, hey, I'm a professor too, he will be heard as drawing attention to yourself. Diversity work, how you end up appearing as drawing attention to yourself. So categories such as professor are occupied. Those who are assumed to reside there also benefit from that assumption. There is so much you are saved from having to do. Diversity work teaches us how the university as such is occupied. Next week I'll discuss occupation as a matter of how spaces are being used. But you can just be sitting in a lecture theatre and be surrounded by a history and feel that the space is occupied. One thinks of UCL where you can encounter Bentham's dead body, well, minus a head or with a wax head, or enter a lecture theatre named after Francis Galton, I'm sure you will know, coined the word eugenics, and who donated funds to enable the setting up of a programme in national eugenics, as well as a professorship of eugenics. That professorship was first taken up by his student, Carl Pearson, Pearson who, as you can see, you can now go to his reading room. UCL has removed the word eugenics from the programme and the professorship, They've replaced the word eugenics with the word genetics. Lose the word, keep the thing, not using as reproducing. They have kept Galton's name, however. When asked to justify the continued use of Galton's name by a member of the audience at a panel, Why Isn't My Professor Black, that took place in 2016, the Pro Vice Chancellor of UCL said, In my defence, I inherited him. Use inheritance becomes use as inheritance. And as you'll probably know, UCL recently housed a conference on eugenics, keep the thing, find the word. Sometimes we are asked to reproduce what we do not inherit. I've lost count of the number of times when I, as a scholar of colour, have been asked to speak at conferences and then I've read the course of papers and it still only refers to the work of white academics. Whiteness can be so occupying, like a phone line that's always busy. <laughs> Maybe you are invited to speak because if you speak, then the conference will not be white. The fantasy that you bring an end to whiteness is how whiteness is reproduced as a line. 
One time when I read such a call for papers, same old, same old, I said something. And sometimes you say something because of what they're doing. You keep saying it because they're doing it. His explanation, I try to cater to my more conservative colleagues who I feel might need a kind of reassurance achieved by citing people they are well acquainted with. So sexism and racism become a kind of citational practice, but also a catering system, justified as a form of reassurance, a way of keeping things familiar for those who want to conserve the familiar, a system of acquaintance, a friendship network, a kinship network, something that you do on behalf of others to reassure others that the system in which they reproduce themselves will be reproduced. Friendly, like. So this is why in Living a Feminist Life I called white men as an institutional category, a citational relational. Citation is another way of talking about the use of use. You might be asked to follow the well-trodden paths of citation, to cite properly as to cite those deemed to already have had the most influence. The more a path is used, the more a path is used. The more he is cited, the more he is cited. We might want to consider how such paths are kept clear through work, how occupation depends upon erasure, such and such white man might become an originator of a concept, an idea as becoming seminal by removing traces of those who were there before. So occupation as ground clearing, removing traces of use as well as of others. When you question such erasures, you're questioning the use of time. How much time is occupied in a course to a narrow body of work, you're questioning how time is distributed. Sometimes even a question is treated as damage, as causing damage, as damaging the syllabus, say, by not revering what or who you are supposed to revere. Decolonising the curriculum as a project has indeed been framed as an act of vandalism, a willful destruction of our universals, knocking off the heads of statues, snapping at the thrones of the philosopher kings. We are familiar with this problem from how the important work being done here at Cambridge was framed by the media, and it is, it is an old problem. The question raised about the use of Galton's name during the Why Isn't My Professor Black panel, which is a great question, Why Isn't My Professor Black, which led, I would add, to a wider and meaningful discussion about the role of Galton's legacy at UCL, was represented to the wider public as the Galton Must Fall campaign. Whilst we might support such a campaign if it did exist, there was in fact no such campaign. It was invented by the media to discredit the questioning of a legacy as censorship. When it was pointed out that the campaign did not exist, small amendments or clarifications were made. And what is clarifying for us is how discrediting works. To discredit the questioning of a legacy is to discredit the questioner. To expose a problem is then to, to pose a problem. To name the problem is to become a problem. There she is, scratching away at the wall, the killjoy at work. This is my conclusion. It's called Utility and Policy. A history of a university is also a history of what and who has been selected, as well as what and who has not been. I try to show in my lecture today how selection goes all the way down, brick by brick, paper by paper, person by person. Once selections are made, they can recede, becoming part of the background. When you meet the requirements, you become part of the background. If you arrive without meeting the requirements, you appear intrusive. So those who don't meet the requirements are teaching us about the requirements. We need to confront what is behind us. I have found the minute books of London University to be incredibly useful as a way of giving us a record of decisions. We learn about stones, but also paper, how the first prospectuses were put together, how the university was given publicity. We learn about paper, but also persons. The minutes from May 20th, 1827 report it was resolved that each member of council should use his personal influence to induce such proprietors as he may select. A network of influence can be how a university is funded, how a university is assembled as a body. I'll return to these networks of influence in my discussion of complaint next week. Complaint has taught me just how much they matter and how, how much their mattering is embedded in the materials of the organisation. My task today was to show how institutions are built from small acts of use, 
from uses of use and how building blocks put together over time become walls, walls that enable some bodies to enter, stay put, progress, others not. You come up against how use can thicken, rather like cement, to form a wall when you are trying to transform organisations so they are more accommodating or when you enter an organisation that has not been built for you. One of my projects has been in this work to put ordinary use back into the archives of utilitarianism as a way of thinking how utility does not simply come from the outside in. In other words, quite simply, use is an inside job. It is how the house is built. I've been thinking of use as building works, a building that is being built for some to use. So utilitarianism could be thought then not only as a political technique, which it is and it was, but as a building project, the selection of what is deemed to be of most general benefit. Bentham, in his writing on publicity, stated, the whole kingdom, the great globe itself, will become a gymnasium in which every man exercises himself before the eyes of every other man. Each gesture, every turn of limb or feature in those whose motions have a visible impact on the general happiness will be noticed and marked down. So if general happiness is the end, use becomes a means. You have not only to make use of the limbs, but to record that use, to record that use. This is how utility then becomes a measuring and a calculating system. So technologies such as audit culture, impact culture, rest then upon the building work provided by use. Bentham's ideal might seem rather close to our real. You are, after all, invited to record evidence of your own impact, even to create evidence by asking for letters from those who have used your work, letters that then you use to show where your work has been, creating trails so we can tell tales. So use is used as evidence. When citation becomes an index, other things follow. The more he is cited, the more evidence of impact, the more value to an organisation, the more time he is given to do the work, the more he writes, the more he is cited, and so on, and so on, and so it goes on. So when we are talking about being given time for the motions that can have an impact on general happiness, we are talking about others doing other kinds of work. She does more of the housework, the administrative work, the pastoral work, the work that is less valued, diversity work. I'm using gender pronouns here for a reason. I think sexism and racism in the academy are also about whose paths are cleared. The paths that lead up, up, higher still. They're about whose load is being lightened, who becomes usable as a mean, means to lighten the load for others. A lightening, perhaps even a whitening, that is assumed to be of general benefit, a higher score, we all get more. So paths into organisations become paths up and through them. We are also learning from uses of use, the techniques of what I would call simply general direction. Bentham wrote about what he called indirect legislation, methods other than the law that can be used to direct individuals towards what are agreed to be the most beneficial ends. So you reward what would be most useful, and I think it's really interesting that the word reward comes from a warden. It really reminds us to think about happiness in relation to surveillance as a motive for the performance of actions useful to society whilst you punish actions to which we ascribe an injurious tendency. So to be selected is to be directed. To be selected is to be directed towards that which is agreed to be of general benefit. You can see how I've, I've actually drawn a lot on Bentham in, in, in describing happiness as a technique in my book, The Promise of Happiness. To be selected might require not going in a certain direction. And I have heard it again and again from students, but also from colleagues, how they were directed away from certain kinds of work here in the academy, away from certain stances, away from words even, don't do a feminist project, that won't get you very far. Don't do race, that's too narrow. Race and gender are often framed as too narrow. The universal is given width and breadth, speed, faster, lighter. We can and we do refuse these instructions. But I think we need to listen to them, to learn from what they are asking. It is not just that you are directed away from what would compromise your own happiness, your career, your trajectory, but from what will compromise what is deemed general happiness, what we might even call institutional happiness. So some directions become drains, which is to say they drain resources from others. So if you cannot show, this is where utility becomes policy, finally. If you cannot show how you contribute to general happiness, you become a drain taking energy and resources away from something or somebody else. 
In order to avoid becoming a drain, selection becomes a necessary, everyday and even moral activity. So selection here can be self-selection, when you select what you do do from what you could do, depending on which direction could be best used as evidence of your contribution. Or selection can be made by others, heads of department or, or, or mentors or peers, who might want you to do what would contribute most to your own progression. So in the end, you can end up willingly not doing what cannot be used as evidence of your own contribution. These are complex dynamics that I think we need to describe. So we could think of all selection as methodical, how from a diverse range of possibilities, some possibilities are selected, that is given the support necessary to become actual, or how from a diverse population, some bodies are selected, that is given the support necessary to proceed. So not to be selected is not to be supported, it is made harder to proceed. A project can also be a path. If we want to transform the institutions, if diversity work brings us to the institution with a desire to transform it, we do have a diversity project, a feminist project, but we also have an institutional project. The desire to modify the institution is an institutional project, and feminists have described the paradox of that for generations, the paradox of requiring the support from the institution you are critiquing. So, we might use the more used path because, frankly, we need the resources. We might translate the work we do into the terms that are more likely to be picked up. But we can be carried forward by what is picked up. The more we use the more used path, the more we are aligned. We are going the same way that others are going. If you try to deviate, if you change direction, you would, in fact, be getting in the way of other people's emotions. So this is the paradox. If we proceed on a path in order to disrupt it, we can end up not disrupting it in order to proceed. I think of this problem as a paradox as well as a pain. It is a pain. It is a problem that we need to keep at the front of our work, not because we can resolve it, but because we cannot. It's a problem I learned about from talking to diversity workers. One practitioner spoke to me about not using terms that were, in her terms, more confrontational, to enable her to have more conversations with more staff across the university. So she sensed, and I think she was right, that she could travel further by what she was not willing to confront. So if the word diversity is used more because it does less, perhaps doing less becomes as much as we can do. We might use the word diversity because it is light. We might not use the word feminism to avoid a fight. We might try not to rock the boat because we do not have a secure setting, although, of course, sometimes rocking is emotion that seems to have nothing to do with what it is that we're doing. But there are risks in doing what is required to proceed, and I think we know this. If our feminist projects are resourced by an institution, it might become harder to confront certain problems as institutional problems, to speak out about the role of the institution in enabling racism, sexism, sexual harassment, for example. When silence about violence becomes a way of holding on to feminist resources, I think we have a problem, and that's a problem I turn to next week. Even if we sometimes do what is necessary to proceed, we can still fight to change what is necessary. To build an alternative university requires crafting different routes from what is already behind us, the fainter trails, the less used paths. And I think crafting is a good word for this kind of institutional work. It takes willed work not to create the same old shape, and we can all be part of that effort. We might, for instance, experiment with citation, cite the work that has had the less impact, keep that work alive, work that allows us to question what is received as an influence or who is received as an influence. But we need to do this work collectively if we are to widen the roots. Otherwise, deviation might simply mean cessation, institutional death, reaching the end of the line, not having enough support to keep going. And so we need activism here if we are to stop the same old bodies being assembled, doing the same old things. A social justice project thus requires making usage into a crisis. If we make usage into a crisis, if we insist on inhabiting spaces that are not built for us, if we try to transform spaces to accommodate those for whom they are not built, we will quickly become the cause of that crisis. And we can't always afford to be the cause 
of that crisis. So I think building support systems, feminist shelters, safe spaces even, becomes part of what we do, how we do what we do. We have to find ways of supporting those who are trying to find another route because we know that spaces can be opened up when they are inhabited by those for whom they were not intended. And that opening up is work. Diversity work is work. So we can return once again to this image. It has something else to teach us. Disrupting usage and creating a shelter can refer to the same action. Thank you.